ETSU. I'm Cody Ledford and I'm here at the George L. Carter Museum with Dr. Fred Alsup, who is a biology teacher and also a member of the Empire Railroaders? Mountain Empire Model Railroaders. Mountain Empire That's Model Railroaders. Right. Okay. So tell us a little bit about what you do here in the museum. Uh, what we do here is create museum style, museum standard uh, exhibits that have a railroad theme. Some of them that are tied to the local area. Most of them with uh, either a toy background or really a prototype background. So some of them came off of real railroads and some of them are, are a function of the hobby that in miniature tries to emulate what the real railroads were like. And from the looks of everything around here, it seems they do a great job. Uh, what is your favorite exhibit? Let's just go around and, and check out all the exhibits. Well, now that, <clears throat> that's going to be biased because they've got a couple sitting out here uh, of my own. But uh, the, the exhibit behind us uh, actually is a dynamic exhibit in that it's an operating scale model railroad in a scale that's called HO, which means that things here represent 1 87th of the actual size and lets us compress things into a relatively small area, although this layout is 44 feet by 24 feet. And this particular one doesn't belong to the university. This one belongs to the, the Mountain Empire Model Railroad Club, and individual members own various sections, and they've developed sections based on club standards. And there are three main things that they have to do. It has to be Southern Appalachia as a theme, it has to be summertime as a season, and the tracks from your module have to meet the tracks on the next guy's module. Okay. okay, and how long did it take to build this particular exhibit? Do you have any idea? This club has been together for about 15 years, but work on the exhibit has really accelerated once we got a permanent home where we are now, because we would be set up maybe for a weekend, twice a year. It would disappear back into through my basement, somebody's garage, somebody's storage bins, and it would get some work done on it, but we would not see it together and see it functioning again then perhaps for months and months. Now it's up all the time. We work on it every Thursday night and every member has access to this to this room every day of the year. So they can come in and work on it anytime they wish. There are no excuses. They can come anytime they want to, day or night. One thing I'd like to start with before that, if you don't mind, okay. uh, George L. Carter is the person this museum is named after. George L. Carter uh, was an entrepreneur early in the 20th century and he lived in Johnson City. In fact, he lived on what is now the ETSU campus. He also was a railroader and he built the Clinchfield Railroad, which now has been incorporated into CSX that runs right behind the university. So this depicts some of George Carter and George Carter's enterprise and George Carter's life. So when visitors come into the museum, one of the first things they see are pictures of George L. Carter and some of the locomotives that ran his railroad. The house that he built uh, is just above the, uh, the baggage wagon back here and that was on campus until the early 1980s. The university is here because George L. Carter in 1909 gave 120 acres, his farm, to the state, plus 100,000 1909 dollars and some other goodies to get the state to locate one of their three normal schools here. So he's really the father of ETSU. This is our logo, it's gonna be trademarked. It incorporates a lot of the history of this area. It's a depiction of George L. Carter and there weren't many pictures of him when he was young. It has a logo of, uh, on the logo, two diesel locomotives headed in opposite ways, which was part of the logo that Carter used for the Clinchfield Railroad. It's anchored by the ETSU's own logo, and the script across the top that says George Carter Railroad Museum uh, is the script that the Southern Railway used, and that was also one of the major railroad lines here. Uh, coincidentally, an alum created this. He's a 1982 graduate uh, in graphic arts here. He's a graphic artist in Knoxville, Tennessee. And also a model railroader himself. Uh, a model himself. railroader on top of all of that, right. right. His name is Philip Brooks. Philip Brooks. Well, okay, <laughs> let's move on to okay. the, the Crescent Limited. This depicts one of the locomotives that would have pulled passenger trains 
uh, through places like Johnson City. In fact, locomotives like this came through here and stopped at the Southern Station that was downtown. This particular one was built in the late 1920s, early 1930s in the Depression years in the shops over in Spencer, North Carolina. When the railroad at that time wasn't do mu doing much business, and the guys who were the machine workers had lots of time on their hands and they actually built several of these, uh, manufacturing many of the parts themselves right there in the shops. This one uh, depicts a locomotive that would have burned coal, uh, heated water in its boilers and converted that to steam as power. This locomotive actually will run on compressed air or on live steam. So it's a true replica. And it was also a great way to keep some of the model railroaders employed during the Depression, right? Uh, the, these, these were real railroaders. Oh, these were at real the railroaders. Time. The, okay. These were guys who worked on the real railroads in the shops when there wasn't a whole lot to go on. Okay. Business wasn't good. These kits are wood and plastic. Some of them are, are manufactured so you can, can, can buy them readily. Others are called scratch built, where you take materials and you create your own design and some of that's incorporated here. And On it, average, how long does it take to build a scratch, a scratch kit? Well, uh, scratch building, you've really got no plans to go by, so often you start by scaling the material, again, in, in this scale, one foot equals 87 feet. So you find something like a doorway that you know the right height of or a window, and you scale everything to that. Once the drawings are done, which may take you hours or even days, then you collect materials, either wood or plastic for the most part, and you start construction. The idea is to get something that looks like a miniature scene and doesn't look like a plastic kit that came out of a box. So there may be hundreds of hours in it. I've got a depot over there on display uh, in the cabinets. That's a replica of the station in my hometown in northern Kentucky where I grew up. There's about 240 hours in, into that as a scratch-built depot. So you have to be pretty committed to this to be able to get through it without throwing it through a window. It's a hobby. Okay. You, you look and it's 2 o'clock in the morning. It's like being on the computer and you say, my gosh, I've got to go to bed because I've got work tomorrow. So you get sucked in and time passes and, and time stands still once you start looking at these. Next thing you know, it's time to go to work in the morning. You're right. But the neat thing about them is a process called weathering where there is an attempt to make it look like it's old. Look at the roof on that building, for example. You see all the rust, uh, the rusty streaks, and you get so you're looking at all buildings as you go down the road and getting some idea of what those patterns are like. And they're things that make it look real to someone who's looking at it without them really realizing why it looks the way it does. So there's really a lot of three-dimensional art that goes into this. Where do you go to get the, the base models for everything? There are lots of places. Uh, this, this particular scale, HO, uh, is the most popular of all the different railroad sizes that are available. And we've got three different operating scales here. About 85% of the market is here. So there, it's surprising the things that you can find out there. And out there means local hobby shops, uh, websites that have vendors from all over the world, uh, and magazines, trade magazines, that always have ads and they're always advertising something that you just have to have. This one belongs to the university. It was donated by Marion Bankas. Her husband, uh, Howard, built it in uh, the den in the basement of their home in Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, after he'd worked on it about six years, he began to slow down and, and then Howard passed away. But he wanted this to be on public display. He didn't want it sold to someone where his kids and grandkids would never see it. And that was, that was part of what he had told Marion. And Marion found us. And we found a home for this exhibit. And a good it. home it is. It fits right in, doesn't it? It does. It's a different scale. You notice everything is much smaller. This is in scale. So it's about 162 to 1 as the ratio, rather than 87 to 1 on the HO scale. We've added some things to it. Uh, this mountain didn't exist when we got it. There, there's a spiral of track that goes over itself twice to get from the lower level to the higher level, a helix. And we cover that up with a, a mountain that has as its core fiberglass. 
so we can lift it off and get to the helix if we need to clean it out. But this layout uh, has had a lot of work. We had to cut it in six pieces to get it out of the basement. It's like building one of those boats in your basement and then there's no doorway big enough to get it out. So uh, we've got one group that is primarily interested in working with this layout and they've done a lot of work in the two years it's been here. And it goes all the way, all, all the way down there. through it's, uh, it's 12 feet by about 22 feet. But in this scale, it covers twice as much area uh, as the larger scale just behind you. So you can get miles and miles of, of track on here. Is this based in, is this like a Knoxville base or is this a Johnson City or? He lived in Knoxville and so uh, some of it is stylized Knoxville and Knoxville area. But the cityscape itself, uh, a lot of those buildings, the high rises that you see there, are buildings that he designed as replicas of buildings in downtown Knoxville. So it's there. We don't have Neyland Stadium, but we've got lots of other things going on that tie it to Knoxville. We're in for an interactive treat. Get to watch the train go around the room. And this one is perfect for um, if you have children that come in or, or want to interact with the trains, you have buttons lined up all the way around that they we can... Do. This also belongs to the university. Uh, it was constructed by a fellow named Trokey that lived in Elizabethan, and uh, it was in his garage. Uh, Mr. Trokey died. A fellow named Tom McKee, who uh, has been quite a donor to ETSU, is also a model railroader. And this scale is called G-Scale. And a lot of folks call it the Garden Railway because it can go indoors or out of doors. And folks like Tom McKee have miles and miles of this track outside landscaped around their yard and through their woodlots. Uh, so he knew of this and he's provided this as a gift to the university. It's gorgeous in all the detail that it has. As you can see, it's, it's the late 19th century. We're in the west somewhere, certainly well west of, uh, of the Tri-Cities area. And it's a small town that has one big industry, and that's the local sawmill. There are smaller industries. If you go down to the honky-tonk, you can see some ladies of the night on the, on the balconies down there. But uh, you know, some of it is the big-scale enterprise, and the trains have all kinds of logging equipment, plus the, the lumber that they're bringing in to the sawmills. But you're right, this one's interactive, and the favorite button for kids is to push this one. And all of these things, yeah, they all turn off by themselves. So we've got a, got a sawmill sound, we've got a honky-tonk sound, so the saloon can be pretty lively if you punch the right button. TVA is part of the area, so you, you see a TVA dam here, and just further around the corner there, there's another thing that's tied with Appalachia, and that's the coal mines. So you've got a mining tipple, and you've got a mining town built right into the side of the hill where it would be in a valley, where the railroad would run through, where there'd be a little bit of water. And the houses have to take whatever landscape there is. So they're all sitting on stilts. Everybody's on a hillside. The church uh, that's down at one end of it operates as a church on Wednesday nights and, and on Sundays, and it's a school the rest of the week. So one building has dual purposes. And there's always a, a, a company store, and there's one there as well. Uh, this is a gravel uh, mining operation. We see a lot of quarries in uh, southern Appalachia, and that's what's going on here just in front of us. But there's also a recreational aspect with TVA. There are campgrounds. There's a small jug band playing over there, and you can see all the trailers, and even a bus loaded with senior citizens, according to the sign on the side. Now, we were talking earlier about how much goes into this. Underneath it, other than the synthetics on top, which is absolutely fascinating, but underneath it, all the wire and everything that goes into it is extremely intricate as well. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, uh, there's a lot to model railroading. And a neat thing about a club is that you have lots of people with different talents. And almost nobody can do all the aspects of it really well. That's the reason for a club. And part of what makes all of this go is electricity. It operates the lighting inside the buildings. It's operating the, the locomotives themselves. It's operating parts of the track, the turnouts on the track. Most of these locomotives on this layout have a computer chip on them. So they're being operated through radio signals, but it's all coded in information that's going through the track. So wiring becomes important. 
and it looks like a bowl of spaghetti under some of these. We've got the one that's being built over in another room where you can easily see all the strands of colored wire and the color is important. The red one has to go to the red, the black to the black. Our uh, things really don't work. Is there a way we can move over there to the, the workshop room right now? Oh, in, anytime you want to, we can go over to it. Okay, let's head on over to the workshop and while we're on this topic. Primarily. And this is the one that has the least development, but it's the next one that we'll do a lot of work on. This uh, layout has been donated uh, to the university, and we have plans to make this look as much like the Tweetsie Railroad as we possibly can. The Tweetsie was anchored in Johnson City, went up through the Doe River Gorge after passing through Hampton and Elizabethan, ended up in Cranberry, North Carolina. And it was a narrow gauge railroad. Railroads had a standard gauge of four feet, eight and a half inches, rail to rail. So anything less than that was narrow gauge, and this one was three feet from rail to rail, which made it great for crawling through mountains. The thing that you want to see is what we were talking about a moment right ago. Under here, all of this that's going on underneath it, it's extremely, extremely intricate and amazing to really look at, but it just looks like a headache to me, trying to keep it all straight. Well, this one really shows two stages of development. Uh, this part, at least the track is down. Uh, each of the modules are not hooked together yet, but they are about to be. And everything is wired. So there is no locomotives, there are no buildings for us to look at, but there are all these signal lights that would give information to in real engineers as to which tracks to use and which ones were open and which ones were not. And they all need to be fed by electricity. Every one of these uh, tracks where it splits, as it does right here, there's a turnout. And that part of the track moves from one side to the other to direct a train either here or here. Uh, all of those uh, were originally operated manually on the real railroads, but now many of them are done electrically and they are done electrically here. So that uh, we've got a little machine under every one of these and there are dozens and dozens. Everything needs to have electricity, but nothing needs to be short-circuited. If you have one short circuit, will it mess up the entire... It, it messes up your life until you find where it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it can keep the layout from running, it can keep parts of the layout from running, it can let you run in some places but not in others, and you really have to figure out where it is. So everything is color-coded, everything is labeled, so if we, if we unplug part of it, we know where it goes back together. And I was asking you earlier about how much wire this was, if you put it in one string, how far would it go? We'll go around a couple of football fields here probably with the amount of wire that's under this particular one. And this is only uh, about 23 feet by 12 feet. Wow, so how much would you say would go around in the big exhibit, the Appalachian exhibit that we just uh, finished looking at? Probably about the same, and the reason I say that, that it's not much more, is one, we've converted it to using computer chips for a lot of it, so we don't have to have quite as much wire and it doesn't have all the signals that this one has. So if we begin to add signals, it will get a lot more wire. We'll double the amount of wire that it has. And why not convert all the others to computer chips then? Um, we will be doing that. Um, this one will be converted to computer chips, at least for the running locomotives. And some of the turnout motors will be slaved to that. But when this was built, that was not the intention. So it, it will morph from what it is now to something else. How long does it take the transition to switch over from wire to computer? Uh, you, you cannot get away from wires altogether, even though a lot of the signals will be radio controlled. We'll have handheld throttles that will send information to the locomotives just as if there was a little engineer in there. Tell it to go forward, tell it to go backwards, tell it how fast to go, tell it to stop. If it has a sound system, it'll operate the bells, the whistles, the sounds of motors or the sounds of steam chuffing, all of that from something that's handheld. But it all goes through uh, a series of receivers that then send it through the track, an individual code to each locomotive that's on there. So it, it's, it's complicated to explain, but it works so much easier than all this wiring that you see here. Okay. Okay, if you want to, you have a meeting to attend, right? I, I have to get a meeting started, but there are going to be some folks around. The nice thing here is you can see a transition from the bare basics 
with parts that don't even have a baseboard on them, the legs are not propped up and there's no track. So this is where a model railroad starts. This is the next step and eventually it gets to what you see in any other room. Impressive. <laughs> I'm extremely impressed. I can't imagine the time it would take. It, it does take time, but it's creative time. Okay. That's good. Social time. These guys will do more gabbing than working in there most nights, but that's part of it. Well, that's part of the fun, isn't it? It is. It's part of the fun. Well, thank you, Dr. Alsop, for joining us. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for joining me today. I'm your host, Cody Ledford, and I'm here at the George L. Carter Museum here at ETSU enjoying the trains. Remember that the museum is open Saturdays from 10 to 3 every morning, and it's free. Donations are definitely appreciated to keep these trains running and the volunteers going, and definitely come out and enjoy.